Hey listeners, Chris, Scott, Corbett here. We're gonna talk about Vietnam today. We're gonna to talk about the Army's US sniper program, kind of pre before the sniper program started and how the Leatherwood Art Scope found its way onto the US Army's XM21 sniper rifle. So Chris and Scott are gonna open up and talk about pre-1966 and what the sniper program looked like for the US Army. So prior to 1965 and even into the early parts of the 1965, the sniper program was essentially, let's buy what we have and let's see what works. The, they, they, they weren't actually even called snipers. They were termed riflemen with telescopic sights. So typically these guys would bring their commercial hunting rifle or competition rifle from back home overseas and uh, use it in, in Vietnam. They were finding that the biggest issue was snipers don't get a sighting in shot, really. If you're trying to get one hit on one target without being noticed, then you gotta be far away and you gotta be accurate. So the first shot of any new day has to be substantially close to the last shot of the previous day. And up until that point with M84 scopes, they weren't. In 1965, we see a young James Leatherwood working at Fort Benning, where the LWL, the Limited Warfare Laboratory, is starting to look into how to solve these problems. And the Marines, I believe, they fielded their first sniper team. So the 3rd Marine Division is actually credited with fielding the first organized sniper program in Vietnam. Uh, but in this episode, we're going to focus mostly on the Army and the M14. Uh, we'll get to that in a later episode. One of the things that the Marines learned though when fielding sniper team was we need better equipment. So Scott and Chris, so what I think I hear you saying is that prior to 1965, there was not a program for snipers. It primarily was soldiers who brought over their own rifles and scopes and they used them as sniper rifles, but without any organization, no sniper team training, or anything like that, is that correct? Pretty much the best that they had at the time, we found one quote saying, if you give a guy a rifle and a scope and you put him with a more experienced shooter to show him the ropes, then before too long, you may turn a good rifleman into a great sniper. All right. That program. So then exactly. you, you mentioned earlier too, a particular scope that I think our viewers might find interesting because today, we know we have five to 25s, we have three to nines, we have a whole range of internal adjustment optics. Mm. And when I say internal, uh, internal adjustment, I simply mean that you can uh, turn the windage or elevation knob and have the reticle adjust internally to the optic itself. Mm. And the, the optics, the objective lenses and the ocular lenses are fairly significant in size. So you mentioned the M84. Do you happen to have a, a version of our M82? I believe the M82 looks very similar to the M84 that maybe our viewers could see how different that scope is from what we are used to today. I will go and grab one. Thank you. This is the M82 scope, which is fairly similar to the M84. One of the major differences being the M84 was a 2.2 power and this is a 2.5. Aside from the slight uh, increase in magnification in this model and some changes to the eyepiece and the actual turret covers, this is more or less the best that the Marines could come up with at the time to give to their snipers to try and get them to be snipers. Mm -hmm. And what they were suffering a lot of problems, right? Especially in mounting. Yeah, so actually in uh, 1966, uh, Army Weapons Command, they developed a, a hinged mount for the M84 for the M14. And um, the USA Infantry Board conducted their formal testing around October 66. And they discovered a, new, a number of problems with the system. So one, the low magnification limited the benefit of target acquisition. So with a 2.2 power scope, they couldn't really see any, any more detail or any closer and survey the field. They, they came up with they needed at least four, four power magnification. The mount and the telescope were not sufficiently durable. So frequently they found that the turret caps, the turret covers on the M84 would break off 
Uh, the scope was not sealed. It would fog up. Uh, the scope is this extremely, exceptionally prone to rusting. And in, in the humid environment in Vietnam, South Vietnam, that was very common to see the scope rusting. rusting. And perhaps worst of all, didn't it require sighting in shops? Yeah, so the, the, the biggest challenge or uh, deficit to the scope was the maximum effective range they determined to be around 800 meters, but it would usually require two to three shots to get on target. And oftentimes, if that particular uh, M84 was mounted on, say, an M16, any shots further than 400 yards were largely attributed to luck. So you could call them sighting in shots. You could call them a couple tries. So this was the U.S. Marine Corps, right? I was looking at this. Uh, it uh, says actually everyone was looking at the time in early 66 and in late 65 the marines tried fielding that first sniper team uh, with m84 scopes and variable other equipment by mid 66 from what we can see they had about 20 sniper teams operating just to try anything that they could buy to see what would work for instance we've seen that they put in orders for 382 m84 scopes because that was the quantity that, that was available to them they didn't really have a system so much. So they were doing a lot of finding what the problem is, trying to fix the problem, and trying to see if the fix would work all simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So while they were realizing that the M84 wasn't really a viable option, they were looking to such things as the art scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the timing is interesting there because, uh, so as you mentioned, um, my, my father was, at Fort Benning in 65, but by 66, he had deployed to Vietnam and he's actually stationed at the headquarters of the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, which coincidentally uh, was my first unit as well. So, you know, I have a story from a gentleman who is stationed in the same Quonset hut as my father. And he told the story about uh, Jim being on the lathe, working these designs, working these equations, and it actually designed his first operational art scope while he was there in Vietnam. And the story goes that there were two Vietnamese that were shooting down into the camp, and some soldiers had heard about Jim's art system that he was working on, came over to him and said, hey, can we borrow it? And all three of them went out, and, and when Jim returned, he said, well, it works. And so that, that was the beginning of this. And, and what's interesting and kind of the missing part, so we'd be open to any uh, of our listeners who may have been there or have some historical reference, is in that 1966 time frame to 1967, uh, which we're going to dive into, where ACTIVE uh, decided that uh, we're going to use the accurate M14 with the art system uh, to create this M21. What were some of those conversations? You know, how did how did the sniper program in in its infancy identify the who that got involved in creating the what, which was the sniper school and the XM21? So maybe Scott or Chris, you could walk our listeners through the that kind of transition in 1965-66 to where we had a focused effort and a clear vision of the system that the U.S. Army was going to use for a sniper rifle. So 65-66, the first couple months of 67, we have the Marines, the Army, really anyone who can get their hands on some sort of sniper rifle trying out some setup to see what works and realizing by and large that they didn't. In the early days of 67, by May of 1967, Sergeant Willard uh, in the LWL, he is looking at the XM21 system, a modified XM or a modified M14. There are a few uh, special requirements that it had to increase the accuracy and precision of it. I think you know them a little better. Yeah, among glass bedding, um, minimizing the head spacing, and amongst uh, many other um, match. Uh, Accurizing techniques. So that, that was one of the standards. They, they were, this is the first time for, that set the precedent of taking a, a match rifle that was accurized using match grade ammunition for uh, uh, use in, in military con conflicts. And 
to put onto that system, they decided to go with this interesting new concept, the Leatherwood system. And they built uh, in their first set of tests in May of 67, 10 XM21 platforms based off of their Sergeant Willard's new specifications. They put art scopes on all 10 of them. And then they went and they just tried them out to see what would work. They ended up taking them over to Vietnam and put them in the hands of some guys that didn't really have any experience with telescopic sites at all. I think you actually, uh, you found a quote from June of 67 about that point, right? Right. Uh, nine or 10 people. Yeah, so this is a trip report to the 9th Infantry Division Bearcat, uh, 28 June, 1967. On the morning of the 28th of June, we went out to the range and began firing with the art mounted on the M14 rifle. We set up 30 inch silhouettes at a distance of 300 meters. It was fairly hard for the shooters to distinguish where the silhouettes were because they were painted black and they blended in with the woods. Also, the sun was shining right in their eyes. Even with these disadvantages, out of the nine people that fired, 10 rounds each for a total of 90 rounds, they managed 66 hits, which I thought was very good considering these soldiers hadn't had any type of sniper training and were very little marksmanship training. Besides, none of the men had ever fired a rifle with a telescope mounted on it before. And this is Sergeant First Class uh, Willard. So by that time, it seemed like Sergeant Willard in coordination with uh, the AMTU, LWL, James Leatherwood, a few other interested parties, had devised a system that seemed to be working. And roughly a year goes by where they're testing this system out. They find that the maximum precision of it is a five inch group at 700 meters. Anything better than that, you're just lucky. But that's still, that's pretty good enough in wartime, especially with the art system enabling you that first round hit. June of 68 rolls around and General Ewell over in the 9th Infantry Division is looking around saying, we need a sniper program. I've heard a lot of good things about this Sergeant Willard. He better come over here and build me up a system. The 9th had a glorious history in World War II. It served in Africa, France, and Germany, and quickly won the reputation of being unbeatable, completely reliable in action. I know because I started out with them in North Africa. The terrain and the enemy have changed. Vietnam is far different from Europe. But one thing hasn't changed, the fighting spirit of the 9th Division. So he arrives, he arrives with eight NCOs, one national match armorer, a commander, and 10 rifles and scopes. And I think he just sets about handing them to people. Yeah, um, it doesn't go into too much detail. We're, we're still looking for that, but he, uh, with the 10 rifles, he, he spread them out across different commands with the 9th Infantry Division being one of them. They were, like they were doing earlier on, they were looking for the problems, trying to solve the problems, and then trying to figure out how to teach people the solutions all simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So from June to October, Sergeant Willard and his group are spread around actually fighting alongside people, acting as active snipers and uh, designated marksmen in order to find out what they have to do. What is a sniper required to do? And they were finding that, let's say, they had to be able to judge distance for artillery fire. They had to be able to lay down suppressive fire at great distance. They had to be able to sneak up and get a first round hit and then get away. One shot, one try. And a lot of these were problems with the equipment that was available, but Sergeant Willard's new system seemed to be working. And from June to October, testing that system in the field, finding out what he had to teach his students, he devised the first sniper training school over at the 9th Infantry Division. This camp, called Bearcat, was established as the division base. It occupied a strategic position in relation to Saigon with firm lines of communication to the sea at Bung Tong, port of entry and naval base. You know, that's interesting what you're talking about because in addition to just being able to pull the trigger and hit the target, the devised SOPs for how to implement your sniper program, how to, how to implement your snipers in the field, what does a sniper team look like, uh, what are the 
what are the rules of engagement uh, for the snipers. Uh, there's, there was a lot, a lot of moving parts going on all at the same time. And so that is very interesting. So you said that, uh, so that was in 1968 up to October, they were doing all the research. Uh, then, then what happened? So October rolls around, Sergeant Willard and his group have collected enough information and they go ahead and open up the school. They have uh, a devised set of requirements for their new students because they have to train them fast and they have to train them to be the best. So they have to start off on the right foot. Uh, what were the qualifications? So they had a couple of uh, requirements for, the, for these snipers. So one, they had had 20-20 vision. Uh, the two, they have to be qualified as an expert in uh, arm, rifle qualifications. And the third was uh, optional, but highly preferred. They, they really liked competitive shooters. And they didn't always end up getting people that had experienced competitive shooting. Uh, some people volunteered, some people were voluntold. And at the end of the day, this school had a fail or a dropout rate of about 50%. So we weren't exactly training high quantities of snipers, but the ones that we were training were very, very good. And they had to do this training in 18 days. In this 18 days, they had to learn everything from learning how to get your sight picture, uh, shooting with a, a telescopic sight, uh, trigger pull, uh, different shooting positions, um, how to call for wind, how to make estimate range, among, amongst other things. How to coordinate with a larger battalion for, let's say, troop movements or artillery fire or anything else. And with the art system, I think it probably would have made all that a heck of a lot easier than with the M84. I think, at, Corbett, how, how would you think they would have used that art scope to, to do the things that the M84 would have limited them from before? So th thanks, Scott. So as most of our listeners know, the art scope has a built-in ranging system. Using the reticle, the zoom ring, and the cam ring, it will actually compensate for the trajectory of your round, and it'll also tell you the distance to the target. By framing 18 inches or 36 inches on your target, you don't have to know the distance. The framing will show you on the ring itself the range that you're at. So to call for fire, you see a human-sized target out there. You frame approximately 36 inches, 18 inches on that target. You look at the ring and you can be like, that's 800 meters. That's 750 meters. And they quickly acquire the range to the target and be able to call in an accurate call for fire. Uh, it also, the reticle that we have now, for example, on the M1000 Pro would allow you to uh, call for windage adjustments as well, you know, left or right uh, when you call for fire, once you have that distance of the target. Uh, going back to the mechanics of the camming system and the mount for the snipers in those 18 days, they're not having to worry about math, calculating mill dots, or any of those type of ranging uh, systems. They can simply frame the target and not have to worry about holdover. Windage, yes. And I believe when we replicated the qualification standards, you know, we did engage some wind or have some wind affect mm -hmm. our, our downrange shots. But from an elevation standpoint, our rounds were spot on. So it helps eliminate variables. And so when you're doing any level of training, any of the variables that you can reduce and or eliminate, simplify, makes the training go faster. Therefore, in those 18 days, anything that saved time was critical. One other aspect about the art scope is the, the fact that you're not dealing with fine motor skills. So you're not doing math, you're not having to count clicks, and you're able to just frame, aim, and shoot. It allows someone who is very uh, hopped up on nerves, which you can imagine a combat situation, would uh, potentially create a situation where the soldier is not able to, to quickly, accurately count or do math. They, they probably don't want to count or do math. And so, um, so by being able to frame, aim, and shoot, that also uh, puts rounds down range faster than the enemy can range and engage you. 
We have here um, Master Sergeant Alfred B. Falcon from I think the, the second class that they did. Uh, he's saying, most of the kids we get in here are pretty green as far as marksmanship is concerned. Spraying the jungle with an M16 is a far cry from hitting a target at over 700 meters with one bullet on the first try. It's a good program. The guys train on highly accurate match grade M14 rifles and fire match grade ammunition. All but two of the instructors are members of the President's 100, the top 100 rifle shooters in the U.S. So, so that's, that's outstanding. So they were able to bring in high quality instructors mm -hmm. um, for these young soldiers. Uh, something else that you mentioned were the competitive shooters and an interesting program where I believe, and you can give us a little more detail, that some of these competitive shooters came out of was the CMP matches, which are still held today at Camp Perry and other locations around the United States. So maybe you could share a little bit about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to the President's 100, so that's actually a match at, uh, at, the, at Camp Perry that at the national matches. Back in the day, um, the President's 100 were actually the people first selected for a secret service to defend the president. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, there's different qualifications or probably more to get into Secret Service. But that being said, people that make it into the President's 100 are among the best shooters. So this school had the best teachers that they could have, and they had the newest and best equipment that would let them do their jobs. And even then, they had a 50% pass rate on their qualification exam given at the end of those 18 days. You want to tell us what the rules were for that? So the qualification firing was done during the last two days of sniper school. And it consisted of two targets at four distances, 150 meters, 300 meters, 600 meters, and 900 meters. The first round hit would be 10 points. A second round hit would be five points. And you needed 130 points to qualify. So we actually did our own variation of this art qualification. Um, when we put it, to make it a little bit more interesting, we put it on two different scope and rifle platforms. One using the Art M1000 Pro, and the other one using our Pentelux TAC VF 4 to 21st focal plane. Because we didn't have a, a 900 meter target, we set our targets up between 100 to 650 yards. And to add an element of uh, additional challenge, we wanted to vary the distances, so we had to swing the rifle and acquire a new sight picture to get on target. For some of their uh, programs during the school, they actually performed a similar tactic where in between shots, sometimes they would have you rack your zoom all the way back to the widest it could be to simulate scanning the battlefield. Then you sight your target, you bring it all the way back in. It's going to take you a little extra time, but it's a, a tactic that they had to get used to using. And with the art scope, it was something they could do. Mm -hmm. You know, but in that, I would just like to say, even if you're zooming out to be able to scan and then you zoom back in on your target, you don't have to take your eye off the target. You're not using an external range finder or moving from a, a spotting scope to your rifle to try to acquire the target. So again, there's a, there's a speed aspect of being able to look through your scope at a lower magnification than zooming in. And when you're zooming in, you're actually ranging that target. So. So we definitely, um, I don't have as much experience, experience on rifles as Chris here does. He's been shooting quite a bit longer and many thousands more rounds than I have. <laughs> so we gave him the more complicated scope and I went ahead and used the art scope, which I'm a little familiar with. Again, not as familiar as he is. I wouldn't say I've gone through an 18 day sniper training program on it, but I knew how to pull a trigger. I knew how to rack the bolt and I knew how to work the cam and the zoom ring. So I figured let's go ahead and run this qualification exam, us against each other, time limit. And that art scope was a great force equalizer. I was, I was so close to keeping up with this guy, <laughs> but we both managed to qualify to the art standards at the very least. Mm -hmm. I got 130 points, he got 140 points. And the deciding difference was, I'm terrible at judging wind. Everything else was taken care of for me. Anything out to 500, I didn't have to think about. 600, I had to start thinking about wind, so I did make some mistakes there. 
It was also a kind of a tricky day to shoot. Um, we were shooting at Desert Marksman, and uh, they're they're known for the tricky winds. So the wind was switching left and right. It wasn't going very fast, probably like six to eight mile per hour gusts, uh, about three quarter value. Um, but it, it just was a tricky day to shoot, especially uh, at the target that we're aiming for. So we we went, to, I think, to a two MOA target at six hundred, a little, little bit under two MOA. So uh, a little challenging to put it right on target, but. We we both qualified. Um, yeah, that that that's great. I have a I have a a question for you about that before we dive back into some more of the history. And I think at the end of this, you guys are going to actually show some of the video footage of your qualification. And uh, so that'll be that'll be a, a great look for some of our viewers who are interested in that. Honest opinion. Uh, if you were really having to do it for speed, not just the targets up and you have to shoot it within a certain time frame mm -hmm. but from a who could get through the uh, the course fastest ranging engaging the target moving to the next target if it was that kind of speed versus you know so many seconds per target mm -hmm. what value do you think the art scope would have provided over the scope that you were using chris if we if we were shooting at unknown distances it would have been uh, tremendously uh way faster. Um, I, I had the benefit of knowing the distances to some of the, the targets. So I was already able to figure out my dope and have it dialed in for a certain distance. But if I had to take out my range finder, lose, take a, lose the sight picture, range the target, get back on target, that just adds more steps. And especially when you're un, uh, like under a timer or even getting shot at, that's more seconds it takes to get an accurate return accurate fire. So Scott, how much dope did you have to deal with at the range? I tried to judge the dope for windage, but I didn't get that right some of the times. But aside from that, I just put the distance in it and I fired. Center of the site, right on the center of the target. I would uh, set the distance on the range ring and just take a shot. It was, aside from the timer and the stress of having to compete with this guy, it was pretty cathartic. Let me ask you this. So. 1968 October is the the first class they tell us about the graduation and subsequent classes by the end of the first three classes they had uh, 52 or 54 snipers in the field they went into active rotation pretty immediately the first class graduated November 7th and the first uh, recorded official art on XM 21 kill was November 10th Mm -hmm. So there was barely three days between the time this guy graduated school and he had to start doing his job. Mm -hmm. And there's another statistic to, to, so from November 7th to March 10th of 1969, the 54 snipers employed in the division had 135 contacts and a total of 211 confirmed kills. So that was 1.56 kills per contact. So essentially, there wasn't an encounter they were going to where they weren't able to do their job. So I want to follow up to what you just stated about the effectiveness of the snipers. Once they graduated from 18 days of training, they were immediately effective when they went to the field. This is a correspondence from Major Powell to Colonel Bayard, 18 March 1969. I have gone out with a couple of the units on ambush patrols. The methods of employment are sound, and if the targets present themselves, a body count is usually recorded. The snipers aren't missing many shots, and we continually stress re-zeroing the scopes whenever possible. Now, I'm going to follow that up with this again from Major Powell to Colonel Bayard. 6 April 1969. The longest kill we have on record with the M84 scope is 800 meters and it took three shots to get on target. This is a rare case and I know the art scope would have done the same thing with one shot. I strongly recommend that snipers be armed with a more accurate MTU accurized M14 with art and I feel USARV was convinced that this was the only way to go. First class all the way. Major Willis Powell, Commandant Sniper School, 9th Infantry Division. 
I can't argue with that. I mean, I've tried to put it in the in the field myself under these sorts of qualification conditions, and I would take the art scope over this any day. Absolutely. So then, as we wrap up this episode of our art scope history series, I'd like to invite any of our viewers who have used the art scope, uh, been trained at the U.S. Army Sniper with the M21, we would love to hear from you. If you were part of the first school to graduate, if you were part of any of the schools to graduate in Vietnam, we would love to hear from you. If you want to be on our podcast, we would love to, to feature you and tell your story. We appreciate the service of all of our men and women in uniform. The, uh, a couple other items we'd like to uh, reach out is if you happen to have one of the blue, one of the first 10 of the art scopes, we'd love to have a picture and, uh, and hear your story about how you got it. So uh, Chris and Scott, I'm going to turn it back over to you, uh, viewers and listeners. I uh, hope you were able to get something out of our historical review of the pre-1965 years with the U.S. Army sniper training that 1965 to 1967 research and discovery mode to uh, the first graduating class and uh, so sub subsequent success of the U.S. Army Sniper Rifle Program. Chris, Scott. Thank you, Corbett. We're going to go ahead and dive on into a little look back through of our, our attempt at the qualification exam and we'll talk about what it is that's happening at the different moments and how it is that he managed to beat me. <laughs> well, I think it was a little bit of luck. I got, I got kind of lucky at the 600 yards uh, wind calls. Um, but overall, I think it was a, a testament to, to, to the art scope. So we're taking two civilians and we're putting them through this army qualification and we were both able to, to, to qualify. Hello guys, we're going to go ahead and watch through this video real quick and skip around. Uh, I have to apologize again, I know I put it in writing here for the uh, spotter scope in this first round. We were calling out the distances, but we weren't deciding which target, you know, left, right, what have you, we were supposed to be looking at. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go ahead and skip the first round, just go right into the actual meat of it, when this guy started to catch up. <laughs> Let's see here. All right. So round two, we are having to start close, go far, come closer, go far again. Chris, you were dialing, right? Mm -hmm. So for this round, I think I, I dialed every single distance. So I, I started off with my 200 yard dope and then dialed for 600, brought it back down to zero for 100, and then back to, I think, around three mils for 500. Looked like you're starting ready, getting mm -hmm. ready to dial for closer already. Yeah. So this is the first time that we did this uh, this kind of qualification. So with the added stress of the timer um, and all everything going through my head, I got a little ahead of myself. And uh, yeah, 600 yards normally, like we should be able to hit that, but for some reason on that this day, I kept pulling the shots off target. How were you keeping track of the numbers going so quickly? So I. Uh, well, in this one, I think I wrote my the dope on my hand. But uh, as far as like the, the 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 as far as dialing the clicks, I actually felt like the the Pentalux Tac VF had really really tactile uh, clicks, and I didn't have any fear of slipping. So once I was using the indicator line, once I got to it, I, I felt confident that I was on the exact adjustment that I needed. I just can't imagine. So you were, were you thinking like, all right, I'm going to dial 22 clicks, and then you count 22 clicks, or were you like, all right, that's a full index, another index? I was I was actually looking at the numbers. So if I needed, let's say, 2.1 mils, I would dial to the two and then be precise with that last click. I was not precise. <laughs> so I didn't have to deal with that sort of dialing or dope. Instead, because we knew the distances, I went ahead and just dialed the distance straight into the range ring. Mm -hmm. And I know that means I had to take my eye off the scope and, and break my sight picture, but 
he was having to do it too. So I felt like it was kind of even there. Mm -hmm. And I apologize in advance for some of the shaky camera work. I was still getting used to adjusting the, the tripod. That thing is wild out at the further distances. That much magnification, just too much. Let's see, I think after this round, I started, if it was 100 yards, I would just put it at the two value and sort of aim a little bit low. And I think starting in this round, I would just leave it at the two value and use that for one and three. Mm -hmm. So this one, I did something a little different. I was, I think I dialed for the, the middle distance 400. Oh, excuse me. I dialed for 200 and I would hold under for one and then uh, uh, dial for four and then make an adjustment for six. So we were both starting the same trick this round. Mm -hmm. Here I was thinking I was clever. So yeah, the art scope can't technically dial to 100, but because the bullet's going over the top of its arc. Okay. Looks like for both of us, the real problem wasn't the elevation. Mm -hmm. It was definitely just the wind. God, it's so, so close. <laughs> the elevation looks spot on, though. I was the editor. I should have just counted it. <laughs> okay, so for this one, I, I dialed, started off dialing for 300. So I think I, it was around uh, two mils, and then I held, um, held, I held under for the 100-yard target. So I would use the two hash mark above the center, and then I would dial for 600. I think this one we went for the eight, eight, the eight inch plate. Mm -hmm. And you technically got that hit. It took your time. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to make sure. I wasn't sure I, from seeing the splash, but like this difference aliasing technique is pretty cool. We can see the different, it's like frame by frame differences. Yep, there's that little splash. So this one, because I'm going to 300 twice and then 100 I can't even dial for, I just held really low at 100. I left it uh, dialed for 300. That's what, at that distance, that was a one and a half MOA, mm -hmm. one and a third. Oof, like so one close. target to the right. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and uh, hop back in with Corbett here in a second. Let's go ahead and let the score come up so I can uh, feel some motivation for the next time. <laughs> well, that's fun. We should definitely do that again. I feel it was good practice. Maybe in the future we can try varying up the different shooting positions so we can shoot uh, maybe from an unstable target and get some practice in those different positions. Or, you know, we could go ahead and shoot prone so that maybe there's a chance I can tie this time. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you in a second. So, hey, guys, thank you for watching. Uh, we have a couple more segments come, like this coming up, uh, one on the M14, then it's evolution into the XM21. And uh, we'll be doing an in-depth look at the Marine Corps sniper program as well. Thank you guys for sticking by. And uh, if you happen to pick up any copy of Senek's book, I recommend you read it because there's a lot of lost history in these. Corbett, thank you for stopping on by. Always happy to delve into your father's history. And again, anyone out there, if you happen to know any secrets of that 66 to 67 time frame, send them our way. Great. Out.